Right, well, uh, um, my name's Adam Tooze, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you this morning to um, this session on inflation. Um, the topic could hardly be more urgent. Um, inflations are, historically speaking, and I think more than that, almost sort of metaphysically speaking, the great shadow that hangs over all monetary systems. They are the fear that lurks in the, under the bed or in the cupboard. They're the fear that drive so many people into the arms of cryptocurrency as one of the ways of avoiding that. Um, they are also uh, huge challenges to political authority when they become very large. They, they can shake a state to its foundations. Even in more modest terms, they can um, affect very large redistributions of, of income and wealth. Um, through their effects on real incomes and through their effects on monetary assets and the offsetting yield chasing that we see into other categories. Um, it's not too much to say, I think, that the history of economic policy is punctuated by a series of debates about what inflation means and what we should do about it. In fact, it's not entirely unfair, I think, to say that the entire economic paradigm of the last 50 years was shaped by reactions to the traumatic experience of the 1970s. And until, yes, last year, I was going to say yesterday, I don't mean quite yesterday, but the day before yesterday, until last summer, we thought, the central banking community, I think, and the wider policy thought, the community thought, we had this problem lit. And you could tell because major central banks around the world on both sides of the Atlantic, the Fed and the ECB, engaged in historical changes to the way in which they pursued the arbitrary but nevertheless historically established target of 2% inflation, moving to average inflation targeting in the US, and a symmetrical redefinition of Europe's inflation target, which implied that downside risk, in other words, deflation, was as large as upside risk. And now we find ourselves here today um, in a very, very different world. Um, and uh, in fact, the WEF ha has uh, been conducting its own research with a poll of chief economists around the world, uh, surveying them on their assessment of the world. The panelists are in a slightly unfortunate position, but you in the audience can see this very well. We can see it there. And I can cheat. Oh, we can see it ahead of us there. And you can see <laughs> that huge majorities of chief economists in leading business uh, firms and central banks around the world, at least in Europe, Latin America, and Africa, see inflation as a major problem. In many of those parts of the world, it's not just inflation, but it's food insecurity that is a pressing issue. As we were hearing earlier this morning, uh, the one part of the world where inflation is not currently seen as the major threat is, in fact, Asia, for interesting reasons that we may get into on the panel. But we are very much not in the world that we were in six months ago, um, or perhaps nine months ago at least, where that long-running process is adjusting the entire policy model was underway. And I think many of us felt very convinced that that was the right thing to do. It now feels like a rather obsolete self-confidence. In any case, we have a wonderful panel to discuss these uh, issues with us this morning. I'm going to just introduce our speakers from this end to that end before asking them to make a few opening statements. To my immediate left is Klaus Knut, who is the president of the Central Bank of the Netherlands and also of the Financial Stability Board. So he's wearing two hats, both the inflation and the financial stability control hat. Next to Klaus is uh, Ricardo Hausmann, who is the founder and director of the Growth Lab at Harvard University, but before that looked back on a very illustrious career in Latin American economic policy starting in Venezuela by way of the Inter-American Development Bank. <coughs> Next to Ricardo, you have Rene Notto, a partner and president of Bright Star Capital Partners, who brings to us this morning the private sector view, the view especially from the middle market, so not the grand titans of global business, but the middle market of American capitalism. And then on the left, my friend Jason Furman, currently the Etna Professor of the Practice of Economic Policy, but before, the, before that Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors in the Obama administration. And they, so we have a really great lineup here. And I think perhaps I'll ask Jason to start by giving us his take on the inflation picture, perhaps particularly in the United States where the pressure is largest, but also some comparative observations that you might have for us, Jason. Great. Um, well, thanks so much. for Thanks for having me in this discussion. And a sense of just how quickly this shifted is last year I was doing lots of cheap talk about inflation being high and inflation being persistent. And when I say cheap talk, I was paid less than a dollar a word by the Wall Street Journal for writing about it. And if my predictions were wrong, I didn't lose any money. Um, a friend of mine said, this is all cheap talk, so let's actually have a bet on this. Uh, my friend worked in finance, so he's a much better bargainer than I was. At the time, the consensus forecast was inflation this year 
would be 2.2%. That was in December. That was five months ago. Um, he was such a good bargainer, he got to made the bet over under on 3% on even odds. Um, I took the bet. Um, two months after making the bet, he conceded it and bought me dinner. Um, in five months, we've gone from a world where 2% inflation in the United States was conceivable this year to a world where if we only had 4 or 5% inflation, um, we would count ourselves um, lucky. The inflation is worldwide. It's up almost everywhere. Some of that is for the same reasons, especially on the supply side with um, shortages in things like microchips, things like oil and food. But there's a lot of differences across countries in terms of the causes. In the United States, a much higher ratio of the inflation is um, demand. Yes, there have been supply problems, but people are buying 10 to 15% more goods than usual. So the supply problem is more that supply can't keep up with the unbelievably voracious demand of American consumers. Demand that has, by the way, raised goods prices worldwide. So part of your inflation um, is our fault. Um, the degree of embeddedness of inflation varies quite a lot. Wage growth is much higher in the United States than it is in Europe. That tends to be more inertial. And labor markets in the United States are extremely, extremely tight, with two job openings for every unemployed workers and a record um, quits rate, which says even more inflationary pressures. The consequences vary across countries. Here it's worse for Europe for the exact opposite of the reason I just said. Our inflation is more homegrown, more demand driven. That means we have higher nominal wages, higher, higher nominal wage growth, higher price growth. Real wages have fallen behind. Real wages are falling at the fastest pace in 40 years. But it is not as big a cost of living crisis as Europe where you haven't really had the wage increases, which means you don't have as much inertial inflation, but you're suffering that much more than from the price increases caused by some combinations of Presidents Biden and Putin. Um, and then finally, um, <laughs> Biden would be the goods prices, Putin would be the oil um, and food. Um, finally, on um, the consequences of all of this, there are pros and cons to inflation. It's helped us deleverage our debt. There are some good things associated with it, but it is so high that we're way past the point we're debating the relative magnitudes of those is important. At some point in the future, though, um, that debate will be important. But for now, um, bringing it down is quite important for sustainability, for real wages, and really ultimately for the political reasons uh, that you started with, Adam. Thank you, Jason. I, I would love to come back uh, at some point in the conversation to this issue of, as you called it, deleveraging. Another way of talking about it would be the inflation tax on nominal assets, including the obligations of the state. Um, Klaus, uh, after having had the view from the American side of the Atlantic, um, can you give us your take as a European central banker, long time also a member of the ECB decision-making process? How do things look from your side? Yeah, well, thank you, and thank you for having me. Um, it's great that I have to talk after Jason, because a lot of, I think, the dynamics that Jason already alluded to are also relevant for Europe, albeit, I will argue, to a slightly lesser uh, extent at this moment. I mean, we are being hit by a combination of negative supply shocks, positive demand shocks. Both of them have a tendency to increase inflation, but of course, uh, the impact on growth is more uh, uh, ambivalent. Um, and I would argue that this sort of the mix between demand and supply elements differs also a little bit across region. And one difference with the US is that I think in the US it's much clearer that the dominance is on the demand shock side, whereas in Europe I think we suffer a bit more from the negative supply shocks. But I also would not want to completely ignore the demand side in, uh, in Europe. We central bankers, we make projections. When you make projections, there are unfortunately projection errors. When you analyze our projection errors coming out of the pandemic, we consistently not only underestimated inflation, like in the US, we also consistently underestimated growth and the growth dynamics coming out of the pandemic. So there must also have been a demand element in the high inflation uh, in, uh, in Europe. Now, the inflation explosion was clearly related to energy prices. And uh, energy price inflation is something that really central bankers cannot do much about. I mean, also raising interest rates is not going to do much about energy price uh, inflation. But what you should hold 
us accountable to is that we prevent this sort of temporary first bout of high inflation to become entrenched and to become more permanent into other forms of uh, inflation as well. And if that is the case, then that usually also shows up in, in inflation expectation, becoming de-anchored. De-anchored means no longer concentrated at our 2% uh, target. We measure inflation expectations by market pricing. Uh, we look at surveys, etc. And the message from these inflation expectations in the euro area is that they have consistently drifted upward. Let me take one number, the consensus forecast, which is a well-respected professional survey. In November last year, expected inflation for the next 10 years in the euro area was 1.9. Last week, the number came out for May, it was 2.4. That is sort of a number which is still close to two, but it is a number where it gives, a, it provides you with a, a, little, a little pause. So what should we as central bankers then watch? Of course, the underlying dynamics in inflation. We're not so much, from a, cent from a monetary policy perspective, focusing on energy price inflation. With all due respect, that is yesterday's news. That's water under the bridge. What we are looking is underlying inflation. So we have a couple of indicators, which is not exactly the same as core inflation, but core inflation is an important indicator. It's inflation where you strip out the more volatile food and energy uh, component. And the problem is that these measures of underlying inflation over the last few months have all gone northeast. And the question is, where do they stop? Do they stop at a level sufficiently close to 2%? Or will they continue to increase and will that then also be reflected in inflation expectations? A second thing to watch is wages. Also here, I think yeah, we don't have the same amount of wage increase yet in uh, the euro area than we have in, uh, in the US. I'm also not saying that there is absolutely no room for wage increases. Let me not be misunderstood here. But what is worrisome from the perspective of the central bank is that if you had a sort of wage price spiral emerging, and for instance, where we see things like automatic price compensation being br brought back on into wage settlements, that's a very worrisome signal. We're seeing that happening in a couple of Euro area countries. We're seeing wages take off in the Eastern European uh, uh, members of the Euro area, in Germany, in Netherlands, in Belgium, a little bit in Spain, etc. So these are signals that we have to closely monitor. Now, our president has issued a block on how policy would respond uh, to that. I'm fully on board. I fully support everything that is in the block. I think it nicely charts sort of the policy course. And I'm happy to elaborate on that uh, in, uh, let's say, the remainder of this uh, conversation. Thank you, Klaus. The, the distinction that you make between first and second round moves is really fascinating because in there is packed the entire distributional politics of inflation. Because if you see this as the role of the central banker to ensure there is no second round, what you're in a sense saying is the first round winners take their winnings. And the second round, which you're going to prevent, as it were, absorb the loss. And this, I think, is the delicate line that central bankers have to tread, because one of the second round moves you might, might expect would be labor, organized labor. And as I can see, the entire ECB policymaking team trying to formulate a line which doesn't, as you avoided saying, mean that the ECB is going to stand against any wage adjustment in Europe, because this would essentially yeah. be to underwrite inequality yeah, or but, a surge in inequality. Just, just a quick comment. I, we are energy importers in Europe. Yes. So it means energy price inflation essentially is in terms of trade loss. Yes. So any efforts to try to shift around yes. the price of these energy costs by workers, onto employers, onto yes. the government, onto workers, onto, that's futile. We have to accept the loss. We have collectively grown poorer. So I think that wage settlements in Europe should focus on core inflation yes. and productivity growth. That is traditionally the space that there is for wages. But all energy being spent on, try, on trying to pass on uh, the, uh, the, the cost of, of, uh, of high energy prices, it's a purely political. The government can decide to do so for distributional reasons. We know that particularly the lower incomes suffer a lot from higher energy prices. So there is a legitimate public policy case to be made for compensation for lower incomes, absolutely. But there is, we cannot compensate everyone. This is a, a, a check that we somehow yeah. have to accept. I mean, as Isabel Schnabel pointed out in a recent yeah. memo, and we'll leave off in a second, 
But there is one group who have been able to pass on, which is the profit margins of European business have done quite healthily. So they are passing on. Yeah. But we must, we must move on. Um, and on another sign that there is a strong demand yes. element in yeah. Europe. Exactly, because the demand is there for businesses to sustain that push. Ricardo, uh, as we saw from the, from the overview that the WEF team provided us with, this may not be an entirely global phenomenon, but it's certainly very wide-reaching. Um, how, how does this scene look, uh, in your view, from the EM uh, perspective, perhaps particularly from Latin America? Well, I think um, I would say that uh, the environment uh, has many sources of risk and danger, but inflation is sort of like not, in my mind, the most dangerous one. The first thing that's happening is a terms of trade shock. Uh, and, and the terms of trade shock means that the, the country as a whole is either getting richer or poorer. Because we're paying more or less for imports. Yeah, yeah. so uh, energy prices are up, food prices are up. Uh, that's good for energy and food exporters. It's bad for importers. And, and in the EM, EMs, there's some combination of both, right? Uh, but in general, it's, uh, it's been a positive shock for South America. It's been a positive shock for South Africa, for example. Um, now, that's at the aggregate level means that national income has gone up, right? Internally, it means that the government has become richer and households have become poorer. So there's a, a, a domestic income redistribution issue uh, that governments, some are trying to address it by pegging the price of food and and energy or by doing social transfers. And the government's become richer because its real value of its debt's gone down and the households have become poorer because they were the people who had the claims on the government. And, and, and the government has become richer because all the commodity exporting firms are paying more taxes. Uh, so so uh, the, the fear is, uh, so the dangers are uh, what's going to happen to interest rate policy in the US. Uh, everybody remembers in Latin America vividly the Volcker shock that led to the Latin American debt crisis and a decade of zero growth. So um, I, I'm on, an, on the optimist side of, of that uh, discussion in the sense that even if the US uh, does more like a mini Volcker thing, and we will ask Jason what, what his views are, um, uh, we are better placed to absorb that shock now in most countries that have independent monetary policies with inflation targeting and floating exchange rates and long-term debts that are more in domestic currency than we were then when it was all short-term debt and pegged exchange rates and the whole macroeconomic setup was upset. Uh, so um, I would say Latin American and, and South African central banks, uh, central bankers uh, never fell into this idea that inflation was dead and they were mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so they have too close a history of inflation. They've been reacting very quickly. They didn't fall behind the curve. They have moved much, much more than, than the ECB and, uh, and the Fed. They're, I would say, on the curve. They're not behind the curve. Uh, and so I think that the, those inflationary concerns are more or less contained. It's the other risks to the macro picture and the income redistribution of these relative price shifts that are sort of like dominant in policy. Thank you so much. Um, Rene, it would be great to get your view, both, as it were, as somebody who's uh, in private business rather than the policy team that we've got up here, and also from the distinctive market segment that you operate in, which is, as I understand it, medium-sized American firms, many of which are private. You were saying to me earlier, they're, as it were, the bread and butter, the actual dynamo of the economy, but they, ne they never get any attention. Um, so give us the perspective from that. Thank you, Adam, and thanks everyone for being here. It's great to be back in person at the WEF, and hopefully uh, we can continue this. Uh, obviously, inflation is a thread that has run across through the whole last three days. Every uh, session I've been in, there's someone has brought up inflation. We buy and operate middle market companies in the U.S. The middle market in the U.S., but also globally, as Adam mentioned, is a vital part of all economies. And what they've proven in the past is that they're quite resilient in tough times. Just to give you an example, in the great financial crisis, middle market firms added 2 million jobs in the United States, while their larger counterparts, the corporates, the big caps, lost 4 million jobs. So we expect that this part of the economy will um, remain very resilient. 
we're seeing that in what we do. Um, our firm is very hands-on operational with our portfolio companies, so we're talking to our management teams on a daily basis. In the current environment, they're actually thriving, but they are seeing challenges across many facets of inflation, and I think we've touched on them, but wage inflation, especially in the U.S. with such a tight um, uh, market for labor, input costs, materials, as well as energy, just to name a few. What we're doing about that as operators, and as a team, we have m a lot of experience across multiple economic cycles. What we're doing is helping our management teams deal with these challenges. And basically, it's basically good business practice, right? We're making sure we have diverse and diversified supply chains. And not only are they diversified, they need to be diversified geographically now. So that's, that's a new important factor. Two, labor. We're seeing pricing, you know, labor is costing us 5% on average across all our portfolio companies. What we need to do there is not only make sure we can hire people, but also retain them. So our companies are sharing best practices on how to hire people. But more importantly, we are working on our portfolio company's culture because as we've seen in this great resignation, people are leaving the workforce, not just because they're not getting paid enough. They have to feel like they're valued and that they have a purpose. And so critically, Right now, we're working with our portfolio companies to help them push down culture and make sure that their employees feel valued. And I think that's going to become a more and more part, uh, important part of what we do. Um, we're also spend a lot of time driving efficiencies in our business. That helps mitigate inflation and input uh, costs going up. And then finally, uh, I'm sure you've heard it across uh, multiple sessions as well, but applying technology. But we absolutely think and are prepared for the challenge ahead. We do expect inflation to, to persist, and, and that, that's what we're focused on. That's great. Um, we have an amazing uh, uh, audience here today, and I want to move to questions from you in a minute. So if you've got an idea percolating, uh, get it queued up, and I'll, I'll go to you just in a minute. But I wanted to come back to something that we were talking about, Renee, when, in, you know, while we were prepping. Uh oh Oh, no, 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 it's really, it was a great observation you made, and I asked you the policymakers question. Right? So from your point of view, what kind of policy do you want to see? And, and you said something to me that really struck me, which was, forgive me if I misquote you, but it was along the lines of, you know what, I could deal with a couple of years of above target inflation just so long as we avoid a, another financial crisis. That, I did say that. You did. So, so what that, I, for me, what that triggered is, okay, in the back of our minds here, we've got debt, we've got financial stability concerns. And inflation, as far as debt is concerned, is double-edged, right? On the one hand, it eats it up. And on the other hand, if central banks react by sticking interest rates up, it can create squeezes for people who are overextended. We've got class here who's like boss of global financial stability or the overseer of. So how do you judge those risks? There's been a lot of talk in the yep. markets <clears> about we're in a situation where central banks can't really drive interest rates up because the pile of debt's too big. That's, I guess, Renee's concern. Does that seem realistic to you? Because if it were, it would be a strong argument against a rapid central bank response. Yeah, well, the short answer is no. I think that th this is overplayed, but I will uh, sort of substantiate that point. Uh, but first of all, of course, as the chair of the FSB, I would be the last person that would want to downplay uh, the risks and the vulnerabilities emanating from the levels of indebtedness in our economy. As a matter of fact, the FSB has consistently been warning already before the pandemic for uh, high corporate indebtedness in some countries, high household indebtedness in others, and high public indebtedness in yet uh, other, uh, other, other, other countries. But I think that should always be seen in conjunction with repayment capacity. We're talking here about nominal GDP growth. And yes, because of the pretty high inflation, <laughs> Rest assured, the coming years, you will see pretty high nominal GDP growth, right? So the denominator effect uh, will be there. And two years ago, we would have bitten your hand off if yeah. we could have had those numbers, right? Secondly, uh, many governments, if you're worried about sovereign debt, have, of course, rightfully used the window in which uh, interest rates were extremely low and central banks were doing asset purchases, etc., to significantly lengthen the maturity of their debt. We know that in fighting inflation, you have two choices. You either do it forcefully and determined, then you have a short-lived spike in rates, but then it's a short-lived spike, and rates can come down relatively quickly again, 
Or if you're too hesitant and you do it step by step by step, you run the risk that rates will have to remain high for much longer uh, and possibly also have to be taken even higher. Now, given the relatively long maturity of the debt, I would argue that the first scenario is by far pre preferable over the second one. That's the vote. And that's shot. why I challenge the fact that this imposes a restriction on, uh, on, on monetary policy. And the last point I want to make is always we should think about this in terms of real interest rates, not nominal interest mm -hmm. rates. And given the high inflation and the elevated inflation expectations that we're seeing, real interest rates are still at record low, record, record, record low, I should say. And even if there will be some tightening of financing conditions and nominal interest rates, I would say that real interest rates will go from very, very deeply negative to nothing or next to nothing. One last question before we go out, and it's the targets question, like 2%. 2% is the fetish, 2% is the target. We adjusted to symmetrical average, but we're still focused on 2%. 2% now looks a long way out of reach. How, what is the price that we should pay and what are the stakes in pursuing that target? Because again, a couple of years ago, there was quite a lot of freewheeling debate about whether or not we should adjust upwards, whether that might not be a better target to move to. Jason, I know that you and I were talking about this before as well. Is this something you know, that we should really be heavily invested in? What are, the, what are the stakes here? Yeah, so Adam, I think there's two distinct questions. One is, if you could just pick from a blank slate what inflation target you'd want, the number you would pick today would be higher than the number you would have picked 20 years ago when the 2% was roughly set. Um, the reason for that is that the equilibrium interest rate is much lower than it used to be. The amount of room you have to cut interest rates is less in recessions than it used to be. And there, while I support things like quantitative easing, I think they do have a set of side effects that can be worthwhile in a bad situation, but I'd rather avoid. So having a higher inflation target gives you a higher nominal interest rate it gives you more room to cut it in a recession. And a couple of years ago, I would have said 4%. I've been chastened by the reminder that people really don't like inflation. Um, so the people have bargained me down to 3% um, as the optimum. The second question, though, is how do you get from here um, to there? I think for Jay Powell to go out and say we're desperately trying to bring inflation down, and oh, by the way, we want inflation to be higher, um, would be a little bit um, head-turning and isn't um, the message um, we should have. What I think is nice is that the Fed committed to reviewing its framework every five years. They did a framework in August 2020. It was this flexible average inflation targeting. And they said five years from now, we're going to have a discussion about having um, a new one. In the dream scenario here, our inflation rate by then won't have gotten all the way down to two. It'll be at three. It'll be stable at three. And that next framework review will say, hey, let's lock that in, two to three, three, something um, like that. So I think at an intellectual level on panels like this, we should be having this conversation and debate now. Central bankers should probably start having this debate um, two years from now. And three years from now might be an appropriate time, at least in the United States, to really actually change that target. Excellent. Do we have a first question? Yes. Uh, Stephanie Flanders uh, from Bloomberg Economics. Um, I guess it's a question for Jason, but also uh, others. The latest Fed forecasts, roughly speaking, still have uh, an expectation that it can slow the economy, not that much, by next year, bringing, but still bringing inflation down to the sort of 2.5%, 2.6% by next year, while still having an unemployment rate around 3.5% and a barely positive, in real terms, federal funds rate. Do you, do you think that's plausible? And if not, how dangerous is it for the world that's living with the consequences of Fed mistakes now um, for the Fed to carry on with that view? Um, so I... Um uh, most of what I do is tweeting where I don't get paid anything per word. Um, and so the second that forecast um, came out um, in March, I, I wrote about it. And, you know, uh, 
possible might be the word I would use, um, not plausible. Um, I've been you know, overconfident on this panel, just because you get on panels and you start being overconfident. There is a lot of uncertainty here. Yeah. Um, long run inflation expectations are anchored. Um, there is a chance that nominal wage growth is slowing down. So I think there is a possibility that 25 years of credibility is going to manifest itself in inflation coming back down um, next year. So I don't think that's impossible. Um, it's not what I'd bet on. I don't think the Fed believes their own inflation forecast. I don't think the Fed believes inflation models at all anymore. They've been so badly burned by them. I think they've switched to the right thing, which is we want to actually see the inflation change before we change. We're not going to rely on a forecast. So in that sense, their inflation forecast doesn't bother me. What bothered me most in their forecast was they had, I think it was about 2.6, I might be off by a tenth, Fed funds rate next year. The maximum member of the FOMC was at 3.5 for the Fed funds rate next year. My median expectation for the Fed funds rate is, is it going to end next year above four? Um, I don't mind the pace of liftoff. I mind that they haven't done enough to prepare people for a higher Fed funds rate in the future. As a result, we haven't seen long rates rise. As a result, we still have those negative long rates, and they're not tightening as much as they need to. So that's where they need to do work, is that sort of preparing people for higher rates. I'm not going to ask class to comment on an arrival, another central bank's <laughs> forecasting. But Jason, maybe you could spell out for us another real puzzle, which is if we're this confused about inflation forecasting, why are inflation expectations such a key variable? And what does it mean to make inflation expectations such a key variable in decision making? Right. Because inflation expectations are what central banks want to anchor. They mustn't run away. We all agree on that. But we're saying that the best economists in the business run the best models, presumably, and the, even the people who employ them don't really believe the models. So right. what kind of a world is this? Right. Look, I think part of the problem last year is this, this thing called the New Keynesian Phillips curve. And it says inflation equals expected inflation plus a term for labor market tightness plus a random term for shocks. You use that model last year, and it predicted that inflation was going to be like 2 to 2.5% two because that model is incapable of predicting any inflation because the Phillips curve um, was so flat. And I think to some degree, the Fed got into this weird asymmetry where they had said, we're not going to react until we actually see inflation. We're not going to react preemptively based on a forecast. And then they said, oh, wait, we've seen a lot of inflation. Now we actually are going to use a forecast to say um, it's going to go away. And they had that asymmetry. Now, this new Keynesian Phillips curve um, had, for those of you that remember your statistics class, an R squared of about 2%. Um, it explained 2% of the variation in inflation, and 98% was explained by other things um, that weren't in this model. Um, so this was the, now all the other models, by the way, had an R squared of 1%. So if you had to choose a model, this was the right model um, to choose, but it was the least bad model. And so the idea that we're going to wait to actually see things at this point, I think, is right. And I think that the really big question in it is what expectations matter. Long-run expectations were in this model. Those are still fine in the United States. Short-run expectations are not in the model. Those are terrible right now um, in the United States. I don't quite know if I'm going to look even at expectations, which of those I'd look at. A question here from the front. Yeah. Uh, maybe a question first for class, but maybe also the others. I want to react to Ronald Weiss, the APG. Uh, you offered to talk a little bit about uh, ECB ideas, and my question would be, what is in the toolkit? Uh, of course, we were surprised of all the measures that were available to central bankers to, well, avoid the economy to go into crisis. Is this toolkit as full uh, to fight inflation if that would be needed ev eventually? What could be done? Uh, if you think creatively, are there things that we are not th thinking about today? Well, yes. I mean, that is not, in essence, all these measures that were in our toolkit to uh, to fight a long period of below target inflation can, of course, be reversed. Um, but I think uh, there is some logic in now focusing first on interest rates. Um, uh, we will end the net asset uh, purchases likely very, very early in Q3. Well, use your imagination. What is the earliest moment in uh, Q3? Um, and then we will focus on rates, uh, because that's the measure we know best. Uh, also, uh, that 
will imply that we will have a, 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 a large balance sheet for still some, uh, some time to come. We've been saying that we won't touch the balance sheet for the foreseeable future, or at least well beyond liftoff. So I, I don't expect any discussion on that, at least during the remainder of this year and sort of into next year. Um, so we will focus on rates. And there we will be guided, as I was referring to the block that our president uh, put out, data dependency, uh, full optionality, because a central bank that is constrained will have to pay a higher cost of disinflation than a central bank that is unconstrained, and gradualism. Of course, uh, it is welcome if we can be gradual, if we can be predictable in normalizing policy. I'm deliberately not using the word tightening policy because with medium term inflation essentially at target, the appropriate stance should be a neutral stance. The stance today is still highly stimulative. So we're only talking about the <coughs> movement from a highly stimulative stance to a more neutral uh, stance and that we will do in, uh, in, in interest rate steps to be decided by these three criteria uh, that are in the block. Thank you. Excellent. Do we have another question for our panel? Wow. So can we go to <laughs> the interaction between monetary and fiscal policy and how they fit together here? because um, the line that we're treading is, is quite a dangerous one. It's a difficult one, as being indicated. Um, we, could not, we could perhaps not do enough. Um, or we could do too much. Um, or, and then there is the distributional issue of who pays, who pays the price. Um, what is the role for fiscal policy to bring? I mean, you were asking about the instruments that are available to the ECB. Perhaps the question should be, what are the instruments available to other actors? Um, perhaps, uh, Kyle, as an economist of great expert uh, range and expertise, you could give us some uh, ideas here and some, some, some perspective on what kind of options might be available. Well, I mean, I think um, uh, our joint colleague, Larry Summers, was right in saying, don't think about these models. Think about uh, how much demand you're pumping in and how much supply you think can respond. Uh, uh, as as, a, as, as an economist that sees the US in some sense from, from outside, even though I'm inside, um, I fear uh, that um, there is just too much stimulus in the pipeline uh, given supply and that something more forceful needs to be done on interest rates and that this idea that if you raise interest rates then uh, you take away the Fed put on the stock market and then you get uh, financial instability and so on, uh, that, uh, that fear increase, should increase inflation expectations. Uh, it's a little bit, it reminds me of Argentina where you needed to raise interest rates to bring inflation down, but since the government pays a short-term interest rate on its debt, it fears that a higher rate will increase the fiscal deficit and increase the need to uh, print more money and, and, and so on. So you're kind of bad monetary arithmetic uh, problem. So I, I, I lose sleep in thinking that the US is uh, way behind the curve and that uh, these models are going to prove wrong, that inflation is going to remain high and that eventually they will have to react much more forcefully. And that uh, if, they, if they for once uh, did more than the market expected, uh, that would be better at building credibility than the expectation that the problem will go away on its own. So yes, there are two sort of big American central banking figures that haunt this conversation, right? One is Paul Volcker who demonstrated that interest rates do work against inflation if you stick them high enough and that and you're willing to pay the price of a major recession and mass unemployment to get you to dampen demand. And the other great American central banker who hangs over the conversation that you implicitly mm. invoked there is Alan Greenspan and the Fed's promise to essentially allow the, money mar the, the financial markets to bubble along at a healthy pace. Um, and were they ever to get into trouble, the implicit promise that the Fed would lower interest rates and stimulate the market. I mean, there is a, a really dark vision, dark from the point of view of most of the people at a conference like this, that the Fed has turned Frankenstein on the markets, right? Because if the key to inflation problem is ex excess demand, 
Where does this demand come from? It comes overwhelmingly from households. Within the American household sector, which households does it come from? It comes from the top 20 to 40 percent of the household distribution. What do we know about them? We know they're the people who own the equities. They're the people who actually own the financial assets. They have been benefiting from the Fed put to end all Fed puts since the advent of QE. So is the key to actually dampening demand and slowing the American economy down actually to put the fear of God into the financial markets and to induce, more or less deliberately, a contraction of overvalued balance sheets? Well, and, I mean, this is the Sultan Poshar view mm -hmm. of, what, of how the Fed has turned nasty in the last month. I, I want to say two, two quick things, and I want to hear Jason on this. The first one is that we thought that markets were about pricing assets, right? <laughs> and not central banks about pricing assets. So if we, the moment you got central banks targeting price, uh, asset prices, I think it, it, it's, it's very dangerous. The other thing I want to say is that in Latin America, we had this, this uh, joke about lousy central bankers. Um, and lousy central bankers always have a statement. They have to explain why inflation was above where they thought it was going to be. And the statement was always, if it weren't for the prices that went up, inflation would have gone down. Yeah. And, and I hear that too much <laughs> recently. The RPI minus that was rediscovered by a lot of Americans last year in their analysis of inflation. Yeah, um, yeah I, I think, oh, the Fed puts over. Um, they you know, don't mind what's happening um, to the market. The, um, you know, this one may also be a good example of you'd rather a smaller decline in the market now than letting a bubble build up and have um, a larger decline later. Um, I did want to briefly say something on fiscal policy. And the quandary for fiscal policymakers is people are suffering from the cost of living. In the United States, if you mailed everyone a check for $1,000 to help them with the cost of living, prices would go up by approximately $1,000 and everyone would be left with nothing, uh, no, not any better off. You can actually protect some of the most vulnerable. You can take families with low-income children and give them more. In our country, that would be the refundable child tax credit. So you can choose pockets of the country to protect. You'll get some extra inflation from that, but you won't offset the inflation for the people you want to protect, and you won't get that much extra inflation because the most vulnerable aren't the most. But in European countries where you see energy tax cuts being proposed to try to protect people, those countries are poorer. Um, because of the energy price went up. So they're going to get lower gas bills, higher inflation, and on net, people aren't going to come out that much ahead, even if they think um, they do, and optically it works for the politicians. But beyond the Fed put, Jason, I heard you say something rather striking earlier today, which is that um, we were talking in a, in, a, in a session about growth outlook for the world and growth outlook for the United States in particular. And you, you sort of were fairly optimistic, rather bullish, in fact, about the US, and then added this rider on the end, which is that you weren't, in fact, entirely certain that more growth was better at this particular moment. <clears throat> could, you, could you spell out the logic of that? Because that seems to me to take the Fed foot argument you just made and uh, to extend it to a macroeconomic scale that's quite, that's quite striking, when, right. put it the way you did. Oh. I mean, the optimism from the U.S. economy is a long version of it. I think the most important point, second quarter, I think we're going to have consumer spending increasing at about a 4 to 5% annual rate, be among the best quarters we've had in the last 25 years. Um, but I no longer know how to root for economic data. When I see the unemployment rate go down, I don't know whether to be happy or sad. When I see job growth being high, I don't know whether to be happy or sad. Wage growth, I don't know whether to be happy or sad. Labor force participation, that one's easy when it goes up. I'm happy um, and down, I'm sad. Um, but yeah, I think if I could choose a growth rate for the US economy this year, I'd, I'd choose 1.7. Um, that feels better to me than 2.7, um, which would be scarily hot. And you know, minus 0 0.7 is something I would certainly never turn a switch to cause a recession. Um, even if maybe it needs to happen one day, I'm, I'm not prepared to say it needs to happen yet. But we sort of need that happy medium. Klaus, you want to come in? Yeah, I, I just want to very briefly say on this relationship. It's, of course, clear that in every uh, financial market valuation, there is an assumption on future interest rates, right? Because they are the discount rate of these, uh, these future cash flows. And uh, to my liking, uh, we have seen uh, sort of uh, corrections on stock markets and like. But to my liking, a few weeks ago, I was also making a lot of comments saying that there seems to be a lot of optimism being priced into the markets. 
in the capacity of central banks to truly yeah. engineer this into a soft landing where we would absolutely find the lowest cost uh, interest rate path for this inflation. And of course, I'm spending 24 hours a day trying to find that path. But there have been episodes in the past where my predecessors, who also worked 24 hours a day <laughs> trying to find that path, unfortunately didn't find it and ended up in a path that was a little bit more costly than seemed to go into uh, valuations. So this is part of the logic that comes with the uncertainty that is there if there is a significant change in the direction of the interest rate outlook. Thank you so much, Klaus. You've landed us perfectly, at least in one target, which is our times today. <laughs> um, and in the interest of the smooth flow of the conference, can I ask you all to give our great panel a round of applause? <laughs>